Uh, I guess uh, to get started, I got some slides here that are coming up. Uh, but basically, I want to give kind of an introduction to uh, to what this uh, event's all about. Uh, basically, what it is is we're going to cover basic uh, comment, and which is basically pushing data to the browser, right, from a server. Uh, and then from there, we're going to move on into uh, talking about web sockets, which is more uh, somewhat of a fu futuristic type of idea, or, or possibly available today, uh, depending on you know different panels have different opinions. Uh, I want to start by telling you, take your phone, either turn it off or vibrate. Um, and like I said, the goals: talk about Comet, and then uh, moving into web sockets and kind of what that's all about. And so here I got a brief slide just telling you kind of what is Comet. So basically, what's unique about Comet is it's you know we're all familiar with AJAX, which is basically a, a browser or a client you know making requests to a server for data. Comet is the exact opposite. So it's you're pushing data from the server actually out to the browser. A uh, couple implementations: long polling and streaming, which just can be done. And a lot of you have probably wrote applications that kind of simulate this by using just a, a, a simple AJAX to do polling. So. Uh, what's WebSockets? And uh, the panelists will be talking about this a lot more. They know a lot more than I do. But uh, basically, it's a new standard for HTML5, and it's a, a full duplex, you know, bi-directional channel. So that's really the, the dream that you want, is to be able to have a socket open up and be able to stream data back and forth both directions uh, w w with no limitations. So that, that's, that's really what it's all about. One of the things that's uh, kind of surprising to me, but maybe not to others, is that it is kind of a, a, a text-based thing, right? Uh, one other thing I want to mention before we, we, we talk about the panelists is basically an event that we got coming up, the Silicon Valley Code Camp. Uh, best actually mentioned the Hackathon for Kids, but it's a, it's a great event at Foothill College, November 8th and 9th. Uh, we've got, I think it's 110 sessions so far, and it covers everything, you know, Java, .NET, JavaScript, there's, uh, I know, several Comet talks, a little bit of everything, JavaScript, so it's a great event for, for everyone. Uh, it, although the hackathon is, for kids is part of it, there's also something for, for everyone. It's a free event, so it would be great for all of you. So, so here you can see uh, kind of our list of panelists, very, very impressive. So I want to thank the panelists and thank Bess. Uh, Bess and myself, we work very hard to uh, pull together this crew. We've got people who are uh, really experts in, in the Comet domain. And then we've got, uh, for example, Michael Carter here, contributor to the, uh, to the spec for WebSockets, HTML5. And, uh, you know, Ted Goddard, done, done, he, he's basically wrote a wrap around all the Comet uh, implementations uh, via IceFaces. So, so we really uh, kind of cover the full the full array uh, in this area with this panel. So it's a really uh, fortunate event. Uh, myself, uh, principal architect at E-Trade. I run the Silicon Valley Web Developer Java user group and also Silicon Valley Google Technology user group. Um, other than that, that's about all I can say. I'm not represented by my company anyway, and nor can I mention any work that I do. But you can probably guess what it is. Uh, then uh, our first panelist, uh, Alex Russell. I'll go ahead and let him uh, introduce himself briefly. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Russell, uh, two S's, two L's. Um, that's my oh. picture. And, uh, One L. <laughs> Dion Elmer. Uh, I actually don't work for Google anymore. I work for the Mozilla Foundation. Hi, my name is Michael Carter, um, and that's the correct spelling of my name. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and lead developer of Orbited, and I've been at this for about two years uh, in the comment space. Hi, my name is John Fellows. I'm CTO at Kazing. And uh, I guess we've been looking at comments since uh, about 2006, and more lately uh, about WebSocket. I'm Ted Goddard. I'm the architect at icefaces.org. Icefaces is an open source AJAX extension for Java server faces. And I guess one difference is we call it AJAX push. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the one thing, Alex, is that although we may have misspelled your name, we do have the correct picture now. So there was an imposter that got in uh, in previous uh, uh, pamphlets that, that went out that uh, pretends to be Alex often. Uh, what I want to talk about now is uh, basically a, a new thing that uh, the, the web builder is uh, trying to use, and this is a uh, Google moderator. So here is, if you have an iPhone, if you're on your laptop, whatever, you can basically go ahead and submit questions. Or while you're watching the panel, 
you know, you, you have a particular question that you think is interesting that, uh, you know, you, you'd like to be answered, post your questions up here. And you can also, even if you don't have a question, you can read others' questions and vote them up and vote them down. So basically, we'll take both questions from the audience, and then we'll also take questions from the uh, Google moderator. So that's a URL for that. Great. Um, so write that down because we're going to probably lose it. He'll probably eventually take that down. Um, so now what I'm going to do is go ahead and get started uh, with the panel. Um, like I said, we got we got a really great panel here. Talk about Comet, kind of eventually how it moves into WebSockets. What I want to do, um, kind of before we kick that off, is kind of ask the panelists one by one, kind of what project are, are they working on this year or at this time uh, that they're most passionate about? What is it that the innovative things that they're working on? We'll start here with Michael and just. Uh, Push your way down. So for the past couple of years, I've been trying to find the right API and really the right interaction for a programmer who's trying to write a real-time application in the browser. And eventually, we came to the idea of a socket, where you put a TCP socket in the browser. And we do this by emulating it over Ajax and Comet. But the important part is the programmer just has to use a socket, and that's it. Well, what we found was that uh, the art of the socket is, by and large, lost. and so. It's not enough just to hand a socket to a programmer. What we have to do now is hand network clients to the programmer. Uh, we have to give them uh, message queue protocols, mail protocols, uh, data access, things like this to make it really easy to use bidirectional real-time communication. So as such, um, my work on the socket has been with Orbited, and my future work has is recently been focused on JS.io. And that also is the URL for that project, JS.io, where we're implementing all of these network protocols. Okay, I'm uh, Dion Almer, and I'm probably the only person here who hasn't implemented a comment back end. The closest I've done is having to hack uh, HTTP back in the day before it was Apache to have it talk to a mainframe and screen scrape as you did real-time interactions, but that's for another time. Um, I think that it's way too hard to develop uh, web applications, and so the reason that I joined Mozilla with my partner in crime, Ben Galbraith, was to build uh, best of breed new developer tools working with the community to make life easier for you guys. I'm Alex Russell. I've been working on the Dojo JavaScript toolkit um, for way too long now. And uh, that was kind of driven by an interest in how we make, how do we make the capabilities that are in browsers more widely available. And as we've gotten to the edge of what's available in browsers now, um, expose those things through JavaScript toolkits or through evolved browser deployments. Um, I'm focusing more on how do we get the browsers to be more capable just in general, and, and what are the evolutionary steps to that look like. And so things like graphics, things like Comet, um, sound, local storage, you know, native access APIs, those kinds of things are, are what I'm focused on now. Hi, my name is John Fellows. I'm, I'm working on uh, making HTML5 the new standard for uh, the evolution of the browser platform, the networking pieces of that, and working on making that functional today at Kazang. Uh, we've already managed to make uh, the standardized Comet server send events and the bidirectional WebSocket piece. Those APIs are now available for you to develop against uh, at kazing.org as well as a commercial offering from kazing.com. Hi, I'm Ted Goddard. I think that one of the main themes what we're working on with iSpace is, is making it really easy to develop push or Comet applications in that sense that you can just invoke one API call and render a page on the server and have the changes for that page push to the browser. So um, for the Java developer, we think that's a, that's a good approach. The next big stuff that's coming up is standards-based AJAX in JSF or Java server faces 2.0. Oh, great, thanks. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, is uh, maybe ask uh, Alex a little bit about, you know, uh, you, you're probably uh, you know, kind of coming from the term AJAX into the term Comet, right? Uh, did, did Comet become kind of what you expected? Uh, it would be as far as adoption and things like that? Unfortunately, yes. Um, insofar as three people raised their hands when you had asked if people were using Comet. And the reason, uh, so I should, I should backtrack a little bit. Uh, the name Comet, uh, insofar as people use it, is my fault. And I apologize for that. It's a terrible <laughs> pun. Well, that's why we started with you, right? Yeah. Um, so so you'll, you'll never live that down. I got to that um, through exposure to an earlier project called Mod PubSub, which was a uh, an open source project that came out of a company called KnowNow, um, who I think has just recently stopped stopped doing business, although they were around for a very long time. And KnowNow did a lot of the pioneering work. Um, um, uh, Rohit Carr and um, 
uh, a couple of other folks at KnowNow did a bunch of the early work in the 4.0 browser days to make uh, server push happen. And it was dirty and it was ugly, but it worked. Um, and they came up with a kind of protocol. A lot of it was implicit, and so uh, I was exposed to that as someone who was pretty proficient in JavaScript and was trying to write a, a relatively modern uh, client for that protocol. And eventually, um, wound up getting interested in the problem and developing a new protocol called Bayou, um, which I don't think anyone's using, uh, except for the comedy project. But the, the goal of all of this was to make it easier to use, make it so that um, when you build an application, it's straightforward to add pushing data from the server to the client uh, into your application incrementally in the same way that Ajax had a really simple adoption curve, right? So I can just pull in a JavaScript library into my page and instantly I can go make a request to any static HTML resource on the same domain immediately. Um, the level of difficulty has always been higher for Comet um, and there's kind of like two basic strategies, inboard and outboard, which I think is the best way I've heard it described. I think Joe Walker, one of my colleagues at SitePen, described it that way. Inboard is something like ice faces where you have server side, explicit server-side support inside your programming environment for saying, on um, say like a Java notify event, I want to send this out to the client, right? That, that's, a, that's a dead simple way of, of building that. But for environments which are largely hosted through Apache, where Apache's infrastructure just can't quite handle the Comet workload yet for reasons that, which I assume we'll get into, um, you want to be running a separate server on a different port or on a different box, and integrating that into your development workflow um, is kind of the, the quick band-aid way to get Comet into your infrastructure. And so that's what the projects that I've been working on have been focusing on um, with the understanding that it's clearly not the right long-term answer, that the protocols that we're using in the meantime, Bayou and, and other kind of ad hoc protocols, are a way to get to a better future where the browsers support this stuff natively, where servers all have asynchronous I.O. built in, and where we can all kind of like uh, push as easily as we get. So, yeah. so, so, Dion. One of the things that, that Alex mentioned is, is basically, uh, you know, the the adoption of common is, has been very slow, right? With your work with Ajaxian.com, as far as uh, you know, you're seeing different press releases. You know, seeing a lot of that uh, come through. Do, do you kind of agree with with Alex? And is that what you see on your side? And is that a surprise to you as well? Uh, yeah, it's incredibly slow. Like if you look at stats, things where we post about comment is lower than other things. Um, but that's kind of the na you know, nature of the beast. If like we do a little post about some tiny little prototype widget that gets like tons of traffic and interest, even though like all the other frameworks have already got that widget, and it, it's just kind of the nature. But it goes back to simplicity. Like so many people just use polling, and for a lot of the time, it actually works. Uh, so you look at something like Campfire. You know, they went that way. They did polling. It didn't work going through Rails, so they wrote a little C thing. Uh, that made it work, and they said, well, we're done. And so we need to make it as easy to do it, um, you know, the other way instead of doing it the polling way for, a, for it to really take off, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I think that leads right into you, Ted, right? Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the work that you guys have done is, is doing exactly what Dion's mentioning, right? Making it easy for people to, 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 to use Comet, right? Kind of out of the box with the support that you guys have, do it, uh, you know, ice faces. Can you talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about that, a little bit about how uh, I don't know how difficult it is to 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 work or how easy it is, you know, the things that you guys have done. So, so I guess there's two areas, some are easy and some difficult. For the application developer, we try to make it as easy as possible. For the framework developer producing an Ajax push or Comet implementation, it's not easy at all because uh, well, the the web wasn't really set up to do that from the beginning. But the IceFaces users, or the IceFaces application developers, don't necessarily even realize that they're doing Ajax or, or Comet. So it's, it's done for them behind the scenes by the framework. And your framework makes it uh, quite a bit easier, and uh, you think that uh, the, I don't know, time to market and things like that are, are greatly uh, a great advantage using uh, your product? Yeah, I, th I think it make, it's, it's very easy to develop uh, a push-type application with IceFaces. Sure. But, uh, of course. Uh, of course, I would say that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so, John, one of the things that uh, that I think Alex mentioned was basically uh, having a, a Comet server, right? Rather yeah. than using, you know, a, a Apache or whatever it is, is developing your own Comet server. And at Kazini, you guys have kind of a, a similar approach, uh, but it is on WebSockets. And I don't want to start talking about WebSockets yet, but if you can kind of relate that uh, to Comet, because I'm sure early in your days you guys probably looked at Comet and thought about doing it that direction. What do you think about that approach? I mean, that adds a lot of complexity, but it, does it uh, actually to the advantage? And, and can, maybe you can talk about some of the issues that that can solve that would relate uh, to what you guys are doing. 
Sure, I mean, it, it, it solves some problems and creates others, and if, if the folks that are providing the solution like us can solve the harder problems that it introduces, then it's still easier overall for the developer. So uh, what we found is that, uh, especially in the Java community, early on when Comet was starting to raise its head, uh, that many of the servers were implemented in a way that didn't lend itself to Comet. They were tying together the connection and the thread so that you couldn't scale without creating a thread for every active connection. And it made it, it, made it a non-starter for any real serious project that wanted to use Comet. Mm -hmm. And so having the ability to have this server off to the side that uses the more recent advancements in Java, although they've been around for a while now, uh, to do asynchronous I.O., uh, and, and a lot of, uh, makes it a lot more scalable and actually initiated that uh, need and that architectural approach. The problems that that introduces uh, are both on the server and the client. The problems on the server uh, center around the fact that now you have two different, probably two different infrastructures that you're trying to uh, synchronize in some way, uh, perhaps for the sake of security, and then also you're accessing them at the client, presumably with different uh, DNS domain. So now you've got to play some tricks down at the client to be able to make it legal to share information between these subdomains. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's still uh, the right approach for um, today where you're trying to do a lot of your non-comment based activities, your non-push activities uh, in a separate server farm, if you like, so that you can more effectively uh, scale that piece of the art, uh, infrastructure independently from the way you need to scale the normal stuff, the normal AJAX stuff that's doing um, maybe some business logic or whatever, because uh, it has different different requirements. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require you to maybe run as many uh, licenses of the perhaps more expensive software. Sure. And, and Michael, I know you've uh, you know done several you know articles for Comet Daily. You've been very kind of involved with that. Can you talk a little bit about you know you know John kind of mentioned some of the difficulties, right? You, div you know mentioned difficulty server, mentioned difficulties on client side. Can you maybe kind of take the other side of that and talk about some of the successes that you've seen? I mean, are people really out there, or, or maybe you're not seeing successes, maybe you're seeing failures. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so the successes I've seen have been in uh, pretty big projects with uh, fairly large corporations behind them, uh, such as in Gmail, you have Gmail Talk, and of course, you've got Google behind that. And in Facebook, you've got face, Facebook Chat, and you've got you know the whole Facebook company behind it. Um, one exception, well, it's not quite an exception, but you know, Mebo started off pretty small and put together uh, a really successful common implementation around their chat product. And um, you know, at this point, they're you know they're they're no longer you know an early stage startup. I mean, they're still a startup, but they they have a fairly large amount of infrastructure behind that. Now, in terms of just like random people off the street or like you know someone who wants to do some small project, uh, it's been very very tough. Uh, people approach this and they're just greeted with problems and there's sort of two classes of problems. The first is um, if you want to implement Comet on your own in a browser from scratch, you have to do jump through all these different hoops. There's tons of stuff you have to deal with in, in each of the browsers just to, in or, just in, to get push working at all. Once you get past that, then you have the whole concept of state. Your server now went from being uh, request response where you have no state on the server whatsoever to suddenly you have to tie everyone's session to a particular node. Um, and I think this is the real deal breaker. People might be able to put a prototype together, then they say, well, how the heck do I scale this out? How do I deal with state being on every server when all of my load balancers are in you know, a stateless mode? And they just can't do it, and so you don't see big production apps. Great. And uh, for you, Dion, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, you, you see a lot, of, you know, a lot of things that are going on in the industry, probably very up-to-date more than a lot of us, right? A lot of us on the panel, a lot of us here in the audience. Um, can you talk about maybe if you have any idea why Comet isn't taking off and, and, and what is, you know, what's the reason for that? Is it, you know, the web's not ready for it, we're not, you know, request response, or is it, is it because of these limitations that, that they're talking about? Or is it strictly a marketing thing that people just don't understand that they haven't done it before and, it, and it's just not getting a, you know, getting out there? Uh, yes. It's, <laughs> it's all of those things. So they talked about like the te technical problems, there's like the niche of people that need that particular solution, uh, and then there's you know a myriad of options out there which we always have in the Ajax world, and um, you know it, it's going to take a while I think. But I think that on, on the plus side we are seeing a lot more uptake, and I think that um, we see this all the time through things like you know friend feed and stuff like that, where they've got you know real time APIs and all of this kind of stuff. This is becoming kind of the 
you know, the new way that you do things, is building this real-time web. You know, we used to look at the web as this kind of like document store of stuff, and now you know, people realize that it's not. It's an event stream, a, a constant event stream that's changing every you know, nanosecond or whatever, and how can we build apps that are based on that? How can we, what can we do on the browsers to make it so they understand messaging better? Um, and you know, have things built in to allow us to just accept messages, push things back, and change the back-end architectures, have uh, you know, things on you know, frameworks like IceFaces, and just in the Java world, servlets, having asynchronous servlets kind of built in to kind of understand this way of doing things, and you just have to architecture things in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. And with things like Rails and Django, it's a very easy way to get a web app up. Um, you know, you're going to kind of jump on that stuff first and maybe worry about the things later. But I think it's going to change and the starting point is going to be a very different place. Okay. And, and for you, Ted, one, one of the competitive advantages that IceFaces has is your wrapper around Comet and, and, and really what you allow people to do with that. Um, but, you know, what is it that, that you guys are going to need to do to get the word out how easy it is? You know, what is it to, to, to get Comet adoption, to get WebSocket adoption, you know, to, is it a mindset change that has to happen to realize that browsers can stream data? Or is it, you know, what is the, the limitation and how can you get people beyond that so that your customer set can grow uh, enormous as, as the, you know, the Ajax uh, user's customer set has been? Well, I think events like this are an excellent way to get the word out. Um, but I think we're, we're at the beginning of a, a really exciting time on the web because uh, push technology allows you to change the way that people can communicate through the web. So uh, as we're talking about, the, like uh, us as developing frameworks, we're, we're, we're being innovative in the way that we develop frameworks, but what's going to be really innovative is the way that people use the multi-user capabilities of push technology in their applications. And we're just, we're just going to be beginning to see these kinds of things. But when you, you think about the, the possibility for allowing users to communicate with each other directly through a web page, it turns every application into a new application-specific communication tool. So in the same way that the telephone or television is exciting because people can communicate in new ways, well, now the web is, is going to take off in new forms of communication as well. So um, that's, that's great. Thanks. So, do you have something else? Yeah, so uh, in some sense, you can think of Comet as the technical manifestation of a design flaw in the way HTTP works, right? So HTTP is, is a centralizing protocol by its very nature. Um, there is one server, and the same domain policy makes it sure that makes sure that your browser can only talk to effectively one server. And so to everybody else, your server is everybody else. So if, if I'm on an app that was served by your server, all the other people who are present at the application are that server for all intents and purposes. And so um, insofar as, as TCP gave us a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, um, HTTP has done a lot to re-centralize the way we use that um, stateful peer-to-peer -peer network. And Comet is a workaround in many senses. HTTP is clearly not the best protocol for this. If I could just open up a socket to the person I wanted to talk to, like a like a, an IRC DCC, you clearly would. This would be the right way to do it, but we can't do that right now. So, so John, you know, Alex start talking about the problems with, uh, with Comet, what they are. So let me throw you that softball question you've been dying for me to ask. What's wrong with Comet? What What's wrong with Comet? Well, I would say that, to follow up on your previous question first, like, what's, what's the best way to get the, what's the best way to get the word out and, and make Comet into a success? I, I, th I think that uh, in much the way that um, Ted's talking about standardization of server-side development, I think standardization of the client-side development is what's actually going to provide us with the solution here. I mean, the, the real problem is that there are many different ways to slice this. Everyone is trying, uh, as others have mentioned, there's like a lot of different technical challenges to overcome. And uh, different folks uh, approach the problem in different ways. And so you really need to have one way to, to describe the foundation so that you can then spend your energy innovating on top of that. And that's how we're going to get much more traction in this, in this space by essentially turning a, a Comet into part of Ajax. It's just another standard API that you call as part of Ajax when you're doing client-side development. Of course, there are going to be server-side infrastructure challenges that need to be overcome in order to actually deploy these things. But to actually make it more compelling to start prototyping a lot of these kinds of applications beyond what we have right now, I think we need to have a more solid foundation. Yeah, yeah. Mike. Um, so 
What I think is really important in understanding why there hasn't been a significant uptake on Comet is understanding and just asking, what is it that developers want to do with Comet? What kind of app do you want to make? And so I would say, first off and foremost, you want to add chat, right? You want to put chat on a web page. Uh, but there are a number, of other, a, a number of other use cases. Like just one simple example is you want to write a webmail app where when an email comes, it gets pushed immediately to the browser. So you have immediate notification of a new email, you know, sort of like Gmail. Um, well, so when, before we had web browsers, we had these exact same use cases. And we had these same problems. And we solved them uh, by writing specialized protocols. We had a chat protocol. I mean, there's IRC, there's XMPP, there's a number of protocols. And we had specialized protocol for email. I mean, we have SMTP and IMAP and POP and, you know, various derivatives of these protocols. So um, what we end up with is a couple of problems. The first is, how do you write chat in a, you know, in a browser? So most people attack this problem by trying to write a web server. And inside that web server, you know, if it's Apache or whatever, some kind of PHP script or what have you, um, that is like pulling a MySQL database, because like this is the hammer that they've been presented with. And so um, they, uh, you know, stick messages in the database and then pull them back out and sort of broadcast them to all the other clients. And then they see Comet as just an improvement over polling that now we can have lower latency. But um, my argument is that what we need to do is show developers how to find the right tools for the job, how to take an existing IRC protocol and tunnel that all the way to the browser. So when you're writing chat, you don't have this web middleware. Instead, you have an IRC server and a browser which has an IRC client. Now, it'd be great if the, the browser vendors just put these clients directly in, you know, but they're not. And of course, there's going to be changes in the protocols. There's going to be new protocols that come out. So what we really need is a networking layer like in the browser. Great, great. And I think we need more kind of, you know, killer apps or whatever you want to call them that's not just chat. Because, you know, that's right. every time you, agree more. you want chat. And, and that's kind of my next question, but I'll let you go ahead, Alex. I, I kind of view this um, as one of those dark, unexplored corners of, uh, of web browsing technology right now, kind of like rich text editing, um, where every JavaScript developer walks into it at one point in their career. And I know there's not that many JavaScript developers in the world. People would self-identify as such. Um, it's, the, it's the scarlet letter, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, everybody walks into it at one point and goes, I need to do this. And then they run away screaming, right? Um, sure. Which any sane person should do. Uh, fortunately, the folks up here are not sane and they're taking the hit for you. Uh, but um, in the same sense, we haven't seen a lot of progress in rich text editing with specs and with browsers. Um, you know, we've, we've got the same level of awful everywhere now, which is great. Um, and we're about to get the same level of awful everywhere with regards to common technology, but I don't think the feedback loop has been formalized really well um, between the spec bodies and the people who actually have these use cases yet. And, um, you know, insofar as WebSocket, which we'll talk about, uh, is one possible way of getting there, it's only the latest, right? It's clear, it, it, the history of this is that WebSocket, um, as a proposal, is only middling, and insofar as it's only middling based on the previous sets of proposals, um, it deserves to live or die by that. But um, it's not clear that the browser vendors themselves fully understand and appreciate the importance of the use case, because it's not like Google is going to stop working if they don't get it right. Sure. So, so let's, uh, let's expand that a little bit further. I want to open this question up to all the panelists or any of the panelists. Uh, one of the things you know, we're here to do is, is evangelize, right? I said meetings like this are great. So what are some of the example applications that you've seen that, that really showcase Comet, showcase this, this streaming uh, technology that you guys are aware of uh, that can kind of, the audience can use to get an idea for the types of things that they can do? And maybe you can talk about specifically what it is about it that makes it innovative. Maybe Ted has a customer. I don't know, right? That would be great. So I'll say friend feed again, just because you compare it to like Twitter, and you're on Twitter and you sit there. Or you have like a grease monkey script that like refreshes it. But on friend feed, it's just there. You don't notice it when it changes. It's always just there for you. And then they went beyond just doing that for the app. They added in the API. And and so having a real-time API is, is sure, pretty innovative. The, what they're doing, uh, can you think of any way that, that a similar type of thing could be molded into the enterprise? So, so think of, um, I mean, right now, what you've, it, it's election season, right? So I don't know how many, how many, how many other people are like uh, obsessively checking the poll numbers? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if you're like on 538.com or pollster.com and that stuff was being pushed, right? I mean, that's kind of like the degenerate business uh, BI dashboard use case, right? That's exactly what that is. Um, and if you had that use case represented in, a, in an enterprise, you know, with much more boring data that doesn't have anywhere near the interest and you can't have a party and beer uh, to celebrate or mourn the results, um, 
you know, y you have the enterprise common use case, which is other people plus data equals, you know, a discussion around something fascinating um, and hopefully a uh, better understanding of the data itself. Well, and uh, along the same lines, there's a really interesting app uh, that Andrew Betts, uh, another Comet developer who does uh, Meteor Server, uh, worked on for the London Times. And it was, there was this close election uh, for the London mayorship, I think, I don't know, about a year ago. Um, and it was uh, really interesting because there was a number of upsets, you know, up until the point of the election. And then once it finally happened, everyone was just glued to, you know, their TV or, or the Internet or, or, you know, whatever, trying to get the n latest news to figure out exactly where the polls were. And it was a sort of battle where uh, these two candidates were fighting the election battle, like, all the way up until when the polls closed. And so the London Times had a page up where they had the reporters out. And every time they saw or got any you know, new information, they just pushed it out to everyone's page using Comet. And uh, the, numbers of, uh, the number of people at that London Times website actually skyrocketed. They were, you know, initially used to having about 800 people to 1,000 people, like, watching that page at a time. But during this uh, event with their Comet implementation, they had, like, five to 10,000 always at all times, like, throughout the day. I mean, I mean, it really, they just got a tenfold increase just because you could reliably see real-time data about the election. That's a great point. And it also makes the point that that these kinds of apps are sticky, right? People are actually staying on the page for a lot longer than they might otherwise do, which is really great, I guess, for ad-based revenue. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to give two examples of, of some customer applications that we have. One is an example of uh, a map where it shows a view of your um, of your site, so the buildings and 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 what that you have at your site, and then you have various sensors that are installed in various buildings and the actual purpose of this application is to monitor when something bad happens at your factory or or your or your base and then using push you can see the icons updated on the map as as various bad things happen you know chemical leak or whatever occurs on the site and then you can manage you say oh i need to I need to send a, a message to somebody over the telephone. You can you can click a button on the page, and it will send a message to somebody. And then when they acknowledge the message with their cell phone saying, okay, I'll be right there to clean up the chemical spill, then you get that notification pushed to you. So you can, just through a web page, you, you can know, manage. I, I'm just hoping this customer's not Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no chemical spills. Well, no. Yeah, no, yes, yeah, don't, 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 don't be alarmed. This is, just a, yeah. this is just a demonstration. <laughs> And so then an, an, another application that's fun is you have uh, some guys in, the, in their trucks and they've got mobile devices. And when they have a job assigned to them, you know, take this shipment from here to there, it's pushed to them in their device and they can acknowledge that. And then the controller sitting in the office also has a push application. And then they can see, okay, the trucker has acknowledged it. And when he, when he reaches the, the, the dock, he can enter in the data and say that I've reached the dock and then the controller can give him another assignment. And by making this communication structured in this way, these people are able to interact a lot more efficiently. I guess they don't get to talk to each other, um, which maybe makes the job a little more dry. But on the other hand, it allows you to track what's going on very effectively in that. Uh, and then around, what app, if this was like the way that you build apps, what app wouldn't do it? You know, even something simple like a Jaxian, right? Like shows blogs, like. How, you know, why would that need it? It would be nice if the person's on there and someone puts a new post for it to show up. It would be nice to see who's on the site and have them communicate. Well, if that you think about it that way around. Your blog is showing up and people are responding. While yeah, you're, it's like yeah. if this was the normal thing, I think that you'd be surprised that the use cases were, you know. So, so, so you like, think it's just a mindset change, right? You, you, I mean, maybe you're not saying that far. Maybe I'm... Yeah, and you it, think that, it takes that resources, it's harder to do, all those kind of things. Right, but, but the technical difficulties, uh, would the panel agree or disagree that a lot of the technical difficulties are solved and you can go out there and put a streaming application, be it Comet or WebSockets, to market? Would but there's this whole infrastructure behind it, like people still care about page views and this, that, and the other, and like they're set in their ways, like it's going to take time. Bandwidth. For every bandwidth, exactly. <laughs> like, it's going to take time. Yeah, I think that's the challenge. You need to change... Uh, <laughs> change people's perception of the sure. way to build these things, right? Sure. That's sure. part of the evolution. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. I think it's going to happen slowly, almost organically, though. Um, so I was uh, working with someone who uh, was trying to do scheduling for all of the buses in Thailand, and they were using the protocol that I developed for this. Um, and I was like, why are you doing this with a browser? <laughs> like, why in the world are you scheduling all of the buses in Thailand with a browser, <laughs> right? I, it's an, I think it's an obvious question to ask. Um, uh, and at the same time, I was engaged uh, with a client where they were asking me, um, uh, you know, how much telemetry data could they push to uh, a browser for military applications? 
Um, and I'm like, again, why in the world, I mean, like, I know how bad browsers are. Why in the world would you put critical military applications in a browser? Um, and the answer is, eventually, your C++ programmers go away, right? They, they learn Java, and they learn PHP, and they learn JavaScript in school, and they don't, you know, hey, the youngins, they don't learn C++ anymore. So, you know, every 20 years, you have to redevelop your app, and you have to redevelop in whatever the lingua franca is, and the web is now the lingua franca. So okay. our platform has to go, you know, pick up the rest of the capabilities, which um, so far we've been able to uh, get away by ignoring. Mm -hmm. So I think you raise an important point that we want to really make use of web developers' skills in developing these applications. You you shouldn't have to learn something new in order to to develop great, great. A, a push application. So, oh, go ahead. And then I want to switch over to something else. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, so I actually have the opposite viewpoint, and that is, uh, I think you should have to learn something new because when you are handed the same APIs for building web applications, and you just sort of <laughs> tack push on the end, you're not changing your mindset. You're not thinking about what that means to your application. And you end up building an unscalable mess. And what you have to do instead is, instead of having like onboard Comet that's you know just integrated right into your application, and you just get to call some function, something changes on you know on the web page, and then just saying I'm done and like let's deploy it. You need to build a, a distributed system um, that is aware of state and aware of presence, and uh, you probably have to have some kind of custom protocol, and uh, you really have to think about what it is. The, the changes you're making with push, how they affect the scalability of your application. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to be able to deploy yeah. to a large number. I, I don't think you have to do that. It's I think it's way easier than, than you described. It's, well, it's a question of who has to know that and how much they have to know. I think right? one of the things, though, that's kind of related uh, to what Michael is saying is, you know, I, I've seen a lot of applications where we go out and we pick a technology and say, okay, we're going to go solve a problem with Comet. Right? I don't give a damn what the next problem is. We're going to solve it with Comet. Right? <laughs> so you need to keep in mind, like, what Comet does, what it's used for, what browsers should be used for, right? Like Alex said, and, and uh, keep that in mind, you know, basically. But uh, what now I want to do is shift gears a little bit and jump over to the Google moderator because we had uh, basically our, our number one question there: uh, What are open source AJAX frameworks supporting Comet and WebSocket? And then also I want to push that uh, besides AJAX frameworks to also be server side. So congratulations, Beth, number one, uh, 102 votes or something. I don't know how many votes, but anyway, uh, for the panel, uh, maybe we'll start, uh, Alex, right? You're a uh, really <laughs> obvious choice here. So on the client side, I know, um, again, I've worked on a protocol called Bayou. Um, it's only one of many ways to get data to and from a client. If you pick a server-side option you're, and it's a common server, it's likely going to bundle whatever it's its client library is. So if you go and you pick up Orbited, it's going to have its own client library. Um, the Dojo, the, the Bayou client in Dojo will talk to um, any of the Comet D projects, IBM's Comet server, <coughs> BEA's Comet server, um, and several others. Um, there's also support in Dojo for, um, uh, Dylan can tell you all about it, for XMPP and, uh, and the Bosch protocol, uh, which is an extension to XMPP. And I know that, um, you know, insofar, uh, as it, it's going to become the standard, we, we plan to support whatever comes down the path. But um, other JavaScript toolkits that have support for AJAX protocols include um, there's a jQuery Comet uh, library, which supports the, proto the, the Bayou protocol. Um, and then, again, lots of uh, client-side stuff that comes along with your Comet server of choice. So uh, Kazing.org uh, has support for HTML5 server sent events, which is a standardization of Comet wire protocol, and also has uh, support for WebSocket, which is HTML5 bidirectional stuff. It does this by emulating each of them in uh, today's browsers rather than requiring uh, that you have a modern browser with a native implementation. Um, once you get to the layer above that, as Michael mentioned earlier, you need to have some protocols to, to talk on top of it if you're not planning to invent your own. Uh, so we currently have support for XMPP and for something called Stomp, which is uh, a protocol that's uh, an attempt to standardize the wire traffic for uh, Java Messaging Service, or JMS, and is supported directly by uh, servers like ActiveMQ from Apache and RabbitMQ. Uh, there are more protocols on the way, and uh, I think uh, that... I'm not sure. Michael, are you exposing WebSocket as a public API or not? Because I don't know of anyone else that's doing that. Yeah, so um, the so the Orbited project, uh, we have a TCP socket in the browser. And what we do is you create a new TCP socket and say, I want to connect to some TCP server. 
And so the data is actually proxied through Orbited and then to your server, but the developer touch points are you write against a TCP socket on the server and then a TCP socket in the browser, and the rest is just sort of magic. But um, in the JS.io, we support as many standard protocols. I mean, we're working on it, but you know, already we have support for Stomp and IRC and XMPP. Um, and again, we have support for WebSocket. And so what you can do is write a WebSocket server and you know, WebSocket, well, we'll probably get into discussing what WebSocket is, but we have support for WebSocket among another, uh, um, among many protocols. And sure. uh, the nice thing about JS.io is we're targeting the TCP socket specification, which is um, our own little standard, but a number of people are signing on to this uh, API. And so, you know, we're getting support into Dojo and we're getting support into a uh, Lightstreamer. And what's nice about this is they can take our WebSocket API and just run it directly over their servers. Great. So uh, now, you know, I want to kind of finish up a little bit with uh, kind of the previous question, or maybe Ted. Uh, well, I'd like to mention another open source <laughs> Ajax framework, which is Ice Faces. Yep. And now, where we're talking about the integration, it's it's in a, a different kind of realm because we, we're integrated with various Java application servers. So, for instance, Glassfish, Jetty, Tomcat 6 all have APIs that allow you to scale without using the servlet API, but using these non-blocking I/O capabilities built into the servers. Yeah, that's actually an interesting topic of discussion. So um, uh, the, the Dojo libraries also talk to, um, you know, the, the Jetty implementation of Comet D and DWR, which are both Java environments that kind of talk talk these protocols. But at some point, I, I don't know if it's on the question list, but we should talk about the scalability implications of that. Oh, sure. And, and then also, uh, basically, could you talk maybe a little about uh, server-side implementations? You get Jetty, you have all the different, uh, the Oracle folks as WebLogic have jumped on board. So you'll notice Web that nobody's Sphere. talking about Apache, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's that's the, <laughs> the elephant in the room, right? Or light HTTPD, for that matter. Um, if you've Apache got a, Tomcat. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Tomcat. Um, although, if you're, if you're proc... Uh, again, people, if, if you're proxying Tomcat through Apache as a front end, HTTPD as a front end, you're going to wind up in a world of hurt. Um, and the reason here is that the stack size for an Apache process is... You know, if, if you link it statically and you trim it down, you can probably get it down to three or four meg, which isn't a lot. Um, but at three or four meg, that doesn't leave you with a lot of concurrent connections to play with. And so all of your memory tuning parameters in Apache are around um, killing things that you're not currently using, such that you only have as many concurrent uh, processes, threads, or whatever the... the um, uh, the NPM, the worker modules, uh, basic unit of concurrency is up to your basic memory limit. You, you don't want to be using more than that, otherwise you go to disk and swap and, you know, life gets terrible and horrible. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's push yep. that over uh, to John on the, on the server side. Yep. Kind of some of the things they've done in Java with the NIO and maybe you can mention that. Yeah, so uh, like I was saying earlier, the, the biggest challenges with the old servers were that they were pinning a thread to a connection. And uh, nowadays, the more modern uh, approach to this within Java is, of course, Java NIO, which uh, provides a, a way to develop asynchronous uh, network programming in pure Java. W one of the interesting things is that uh, when the hotspot VM gets a hold of that bytecode that describes those NIO calls and compiles them down into native code, it can get pretty compact performance out of that. Um, Sun's also got some work around the uh, Java real-time extensions to the JVM that uh, deal with uh, pauseless GC, garbage collection, so that uh, you don't get like bursts in your latency that you wouldn't want for a real-time application. It should be noted that um, Java I.O. performance under NIO is going to be probably 30, maybe greater than 30 percent slower than straight line static um, blocking I.O. Um, so if you've got a workload that's not specifically Comet, where I have to keep all of the state for a session, an HTTP session, user objects, configuration data, um, state for whatever it is that I'm doing to talk to the database, if I'm not doing all of that stuff inside of a single thread and I'm on Java, you can set a stack size for any thread to be, I think the minimum is uh, 48K, something like that, which is a lot less than 3 meg. Um, so at 48K on a 2 gig of memory, you can run a ton of concurrent Java threads. And there's no reason not to. And it, it makes your code easier to read. It's easier to use. Your I.O. is faster. That's all to the good. Um, but if you're using something like Tomcat or Jetty, um, which has to go and conform to all these standards, manage HTTP state as well as managing your session state, um, you are going to wind up in a world where 
um, using something like uh, asynchronous I.O., even though it's slower, will let you scale significantly more. I think that's probably where Kazing is going to come in later when we talk about uh, WebSockets. Uh, but what I do want to do is uh, give uh, a question for Ted, although I don't want to dominate, you know, this is not a Java group, um, but one of the real interesting features is coming out in Servlet 3, right? Uh, can you kind of talk about Servlet 3 and then how that is going to basically provide comment support or continuation support across all, you know, all Java containers and, and, and what that's going to do and, and what you expect to see? And okay. then will your stuff continue to work, of course? Yep. Yeah, well, what we saw in, in the Java industry is that a lot of these APIs were coming up in different ways on the different servers. For instance, Jetty did it, did it first, actually, with the continuation style API. Um, now, or actually, WebLogic. WebLogic had a, had a patented API, so that kind of stalled that a little bit. Um, but then Glassfish and Tomcat 6. Now, what, am, what are these APIs that I'm talking about? These are APIs that are similar to the servlet API, if you're familiar to, with that, but they have a more event-based style of interaction with them. So in the servlet API, you handle a request and a response together. And the thread goes in into the service API, and the response isn't issued out until you emerge from that, that service method call. So you can see what the, why this is occupying a thread per connection. Well, with the newer APIs, we have an event-based style of interaction with, with HTTP requests and responses. But the problem here is that all of the different application servers came up with their own very different ways of, of uh, describing this, this abstraction. But in Servlet 3.0, we have all of the app servers on that expert group, and they're working together to define a standard API for Java based on non-blocking I.O. that will give you suspend and resume of, of HTTP requests, as well as an, another thing which we don't talk about so much with, with Comet and, and Push, but s say you're running a, a server where you're handling a, a lot of file uploads, large file uploads. Well, you don't want to tie up threads per file upload either. So being able to just handle I.O. with a small thread pool in general is a desirable thing, and that should be part of Servlet 3.0 as well. So not to talk out of school too much, but I've heard the effort to standardize isn't going well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard because there's, um, li like I said, there's, there's very different, people came at it from quite different approaches. And, uh, and I, I'd say the, m maybe the, the main difference is whether it should be a, like an event-based style or whether it should be a continuation-based style. And those are two different kind of, abstractions yeah, in, in approaching the API. I mean, originally it was kind of going to go the Jetty direction, and now, who knows, right? Well, but, so. but Jetty also changed their architecture as well to move to suspend and resume from the continuation style. So. Sure, sure, great. But that's for those guys to hash out in a room and get get the spec out when... And hopefully get it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can count on that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll, we'll be rehashing uh, later. But uh, well, that's for another panel, right? So uh, what I want to do, unless uh, give you guys the opportunity to cover any other topics on Comet that you're interested in, and if not, then we'll shift gears over to WebSockets. Is there anything anyone uh, really was dying to uh, talk about or anything? Oh, one thing I one thing I noticed recently is that um, looks like Firefox 3.1 trunk is uh, poised or has already got a patch for uh, HTML5 server sent events in there. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hold it a question until the end. Okay. Yeah. It seems like people are still going with a software thread model, and it gives you a real problem releasing memory when you go versus a web app model where it's like a worker pool. So once it's finished and it, 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 it lets the it lets know in milliseconds and microseconds that it's finished, you can get those resources much faster in that structured web app approach. So the, the, the question is, uh, software threads versus hardware support for threading? No, no. Versus a web app approach for worker pools like here's another web app. Oh, versus, yeah, versus memory and other resources and much faster. Uh, so, so, um, it, the, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the design of Gears, Gears has a message passing mm -hmm. API as opposed to a, um, a bit, uh, the, the synchronization APIs that you might be used to um, in non-massively multi-threaded uh, or massively parallel computing. So message passing, um, uh, you, you generally have a queue of events, and you pop things off of the queue whenever you finish doing some work, and then you, you go do that stuff. Um, so uh, the question is, are threads going to be more or less efficient? And I, it, at some point, this turns into an IQ test. Um, and the answer for a sufficiently smart human is that neither are faster. Um, 
you know, I mean, some are easier to program to for some sets of workloads and some are not, but a lot of times, like if you look at the architecture for something like CETA, um, which is uh, uh, a pretty well-known Java server package for doing this kind of stuff, you wind up with a back pressure thing, right? You, so you wind up having to f try to figure out um, which of my resources is most constrained. And um, a lot of the common servers being represented here on the panel tonight are born of the understanding that you're constrained by memory. Um, but if you're not constrained by memory, if you're constrained by, you know, number of events, yeah, maybe something like a message passing interface is going to get you better throughput, but it might not get you uh, more concurrency. And so the web workload tends to be lots of people on your site all at once. And so threads aren't bad for that. It's just that, um, like you were saying, giving up a particular piece of data to synchronize it between multiple threads can, can get really if hairy. Yeah, if you're hosting all that, right. Okay, right. So now I want to go ahead and uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, start talking about uh, web sockets, sorry. We've been talking about Comet, which is kind of, you know, what, what the browsers allow you to do via hack, right? Via hacks and, and, and kind of taking advantage of, uh, of different uh, tricks to, to make things happen. But in the future, right, we have this uh, proposed, you know, WebSocket uh, added to HTML5 that's going to give us full duplex, you know, able to send and receive and stream data in both directions. So I want to start here with uh, Michael Carter. And uh, you actually commit her uh, to HTML5 WebSocket or, you know. So uh, let, let go me ahead. So I'm a, an officially recognized contributor to HTML5. Um, I did some work uh, to move the TCP connection spec towards the WebSocket spec. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but specifically, can you talk about, like, uh, you know, advantages of, sure. of WebSockets, maybe what it is? So maybe start with a, a definition. Yeah, so WebSocket is a JavaScript-facing browser API and protocol uh, that together are aspiring to put just a bidirectional channel in a browser. And it very closely resembles a socket in that you can send and receive, and you can do you know, either whenever you want at the same time, for instance. Um, but it, it differs from a socket in a couple of important ways. And the first is that there's this upfront uh, handshake that takes care of security and access control, thus allowing a web socket to be uh, cross-domain safe. And then secondly, um, the data inside of a web socket is actually framed. There's a delimiter uh, in between each packet of data. But um, just because we're sending datagrams doesn't mean we can't also have it be ordered and, and reliably delivered, which it is. So you end up with almost a stream of datagrams. Um, and this is important for uh, Unicode support. Uh, but finally, and most importantly, is that the WebSocket protocol uh, is engineered from the ground up to play nice with proxies and firewalls and routers such that uh, no matter how uh, locked down of a network infrastructure you're on, whatever uh, sort of crazy IT department you have at your company, you can always still make a connection from the browser to the backend server. Um, and, you know, this is done by adhering to certain rules that, that you know, proxies enforce. Right. So, so, John, uh, you know, Michael painted kind of a pretty picture of WebSockets, the next silver bullet. Um, is that true? And maybe can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I like WebSockets. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that I uh, really happy to see the the evolution that HTML5 is, is pushing forward. Like in a more general case, like just to create a really compelling platform for the future for, for browsers in general. And it's really important to see some of the some of the features that we've known and loved for desktop application finally make it into the browser, right? Like this bidirectional networking capability is something that we've seen for years and years and years. The browser itself is using native TCP under the covers as a desktop application to connect to these servers, right? And it's clear that there are, there are a huge number of applications that want to be able to do this. So it's, it's amazing that we've actually almost like just gone up one level, right? So what we're really trying to do is recreate the concept of a TCP connection as a tunnel navigating through the infrastructure of the web that is HTTP. That's why we actually have a handshake. And it does represent some challenges to properly navigate through proxies that may or may not be, you know, tightly locked down and, uh, you know, to be able to actually make it to some intermediate <coughs> server. But then what do you connect to, right? None of these servers are actually, uh, first of all, none of the browser implemented it yet. And none of the servers are actually set up to receive that sort of native traffic. If you've got this IRC server that uh, Michael touched on earlier, none of those servers are set up to be able to receive that handshake. They're all set up to expect the raw protocols directly. So that's why at, at present, and perhaps in, in the future as well, um, you will need to have something in, in between that's able to relay this concept of a tunnel through these back-end services. 
so that these back-end services don't have to be redesigned. They can be redesigned uh, or enhanced to be able to speak native WebSocket uh, mm -hmm. handshake, but they don't require to be. So once you've got the ability to make a WebSocket connection through this in intermediary or gateway to this back-end server, you've got the ability to interoperate with any of these servers uh, mm -hmm. that can open a, a yeah. socket. It's awesome. so, so, so Why don't we just use Flash and Blaze DS? Vendor lock in versus standards, man. BlazeDS is open source. Say it again. BlazeDS is open source. Well, parts of it. And, also there's an and there's Red 5. <laughs> Remax 4 script. So there's some issues still there. Mm -hmm. We gave it to Mozilla, but it's actually not fully licensed out, and there's still kind of some things going on. Okay. I'm so speaking from the Adobe <laughs> side. Yeah. So, so getting back uh, to the panel here, uh, John and Michael have uh, have kind of uh, painted a pretty pretty picture of uh, of, of web sockets, right? But I read a lot of blog posts from all of you that uh, are kind of uh, contrary to uh, to that, right? So now's your chance to take the gloves off. I don't know who wants to. So, you know, start? I, I know. Uh, Maybe the guy that said not web nor socket or something. That's that's yeah. one. I was also going to see what Alex has <laughs> okay. to say. I know uh, he has some issues as well. But or either one. So Ted has a. Dion named my blog. Yeah. So Ted has a wonderful blog post. I recommend you all read it. We're going to post it on the Silicon Valley Web Builder. But uh, basically, Ted, go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about it. Okay. So the, the title is uh, Web Socket is neither web nor socket. Discuss. I don't know if you watch Saturday Night Live. Anyway. Um, so I think the JavaScript API for, for WebSocket is, is reasonable, and it will be appealing to a number of people. It's, it's just a, a send-receive API, and, that, and that's good. But I would really rather see the transport actually go over HTTP for this, because that's what all the infrastructure is built around. That's what the, the servers are, are, are designed around. And as, as ancient as HTTP might seem, it's really a fairly strong protocol. It, ha it has a lot of capabilities in there that even the WebSocket protocol, as defined, is, is benefiting from greatly. It's like this ability to upgrade the protocol to another type of protocol. Well, that's a capability of HTTP. If, if we want to really look towards the future, WebSocket should also have the ability to upgrade to some other future type of protocol. But I, I think that the most serious shortcoming that I see, and this is, I'd like to bring up the the bean of um, Ajax Push or Comet development, and it's the two-connection limit that we have in, in, the, in the browser. And it's not a two-connection limit anymore in every browser, but it's what makes the whole thing very difficult. Ted, it's it's going four. Two-connection no, limits for a really long time until we can get those browsers flushed out of the yeah. system. Yeah, <laughs> but but the but the thing is, is that the change it, it the connection limit can't just be n, where n is equal to some number, it has to be a function of, say, the number of windows that are open in the browser. Because now, OK, I've got four connections. Oh, I can open up four windows with four, four push connections. So the, now, what, what the, the key thing here is that HTTP provides something interesting, and that's the ability to multiplex multiple consumers over a single TCP socket. And Part of the, what we might complain about the complexity of HTTP gives it this ability, but it's also a critical ability for any sort of notification protocol that we're going to use on the web. Because no matter what, setting up TCP connections is expensive. It's, I mean, it's not terribly expensive, but it's, it's relatively expensive. And whenever possible, you want to be able to multiplex your communications over a single TCP connection. You don't want to be forced to do that, but you want to have that in your bag of tricks as an optimization. Yeah. All right. So Alex, go. Oh. oh, sorry. I just wanted to follow up on that point because um, actually I, I read your blog today. I thought it was awesome, and I decided to go into uh, the What Working Group, which is the uh, IRC uh, channel where they discuss how this standard is evolving, and uh, ask some questions about that. Because when I went back and reread the spec about how your connection limits were uh, applied to uh, these WebSocket connections, it, doesn't, it, it, mention doesn't, it. doesn't specify it, right? As you pointed out in your blog too. So um, so I went in and asked the, the guys running it, uh, you know, what's the deal here? How does the connection limit uh, relate to the connection limit for WebSockets? And the answer I got was, well, you know, WebSocket protocol is not identical to HTTP protocol. Therefore, the default answer is that they're unrelated. So uh, at that point, I said, OK, so then it's completely unspecified. What does it mean? If it's not specified, does that mean there's no limit? And the answer is yes. And uh, at present, they're about to update the specification to make that explicit. 
I, I will note that that's a significantly better position um, than the than the previous discussions that I had with uh, some of the YWG folks who were saying that it was going to be based on whatever HTTP says and HTTP was out of their hands. Um, so insofar as that's improvement, I think um, having the YWG and HTML5 working groups understand that they have control not over not only over HTML, but essentially over the runtime behavior of the browsers in their totality, since they're the spec that's on top um, is important and, and good. So, so Alex, is a, you know, WebSockets is a, is a huge part of the spec, right? There's a whole lot of uh, text in there uh, about that. What do you see as some of the issues or, or problems with it, or do you think uh, it's a, you know? Uh, so I'm a JavaScript programmer by trade, um, maybe not by choice, but by trade, and. Uh, Twenty years will be something else, right? <laughs> Twenty as soon as they let me out of the hole, um, and uh, we take whatever, right? Like, like we cobbled Comet together out of you know <laughs> really terrible pieces, um, and we've cobbled together a lot of the other infrastructure that we take for granted out of AJAX toolkits, out of things which were never designed to function specifically in that way. And if there was a system in the particular browser that was designed to function that way, we can't use it because every other browser didn't implement it. So we're used to dealing with the worst of the worst. Um, and so, multi-part MIME, um, you know, uh, web sockets, uh, polling, you name it, we will wrap it all up into a tidy bundle and put a bow on top and make it look like it's something that you can and should use. It's all about making it work. So that's where all engineers are. Right? So I want to pose a kind of similar question to Michael, right? You, you worked on the spec itself, uh, you know, made some suggestions, been very involved in that. Can you talk about things, improvements you'd like to see or or kind of what's what's wrong, what what, what can be done, and uh, maybe we can see what other, uh, you know, people agree or disagree. Um, so one thing we're struggling with right now is that uh, it, it turns out that the, the promise of getting through all proxies is, is much harder to deliver on um, than it is to promise, but we have one surefire way of doing it, and that is as long as you encrypt everything, you have encryption on both ends, then you're fine. Like, it'll always go through all proxies because the proxies are built not to understand what's inside of an encrypted stream. And so they're built to say you can't do bidirectional communication in real time, but then they have this conflicting rule, which is I cannot look inside of a, you know, an encrypted stream. And so as long as you do your bidirectional communication inside of the encrypted stream, then everything is perfect. Now, you know, I'm glad we have this recourse, and it's, it's really good that this works because you know, give us any like, single little hole that, that allows us to talk through it, and like, we'll rip it apart and you know, like, you know, push like, armies and elephants, everything we can through that hole. And you know, like Alex said, we'll wrap it up and you know, give you really nice APIs. But what we really need is a way to do this without encryption. Um, and that's what we're working on. And it's not really clear that we'll be able to. Um, the way the spec is set up now, we may have to resort to uh, doing some kind of like long pulling over the spec, or we might have to have two separate connections, one for up, one for down, or do some kind of HTTP pipelining thing. Uh, we haven't really resolved it yet. Um, and then the second thing is, a lot of people come and say, well, hold on a second, this WebSocket handshake, like, I, I see you have it there for access control, but can't we think of something else? Because the handshake is in band, and that means when you open the connection, the first thing you do is send back and forth this security handshake to make sure that everything is good and the browser actually has access to this backend service. But a lot of people say, we already have TCP services, and we want some way to adapt those to the browser, and we don't want to have to use some kind of middleware doing translation. So instead, and that's, um, as I understand it, what Kazing and, and Orbited do. And so what a lot of these people argue for is let's have an out-of-band uh, way of doing access control, sort of like Flash's cross-domain policy, where you first open a port up and say, can I have access to the service? Then once it explicitly says yes, then you can open a direct socket that's just like a normal socket. Um, these, I think, are the, the two largest shortcomings of the spec right now. Okay. So, so Dion, kind of a question for you, and it's kind of an unfair question, because the spec's not complete. We don't have it, right? The date, way, way out there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, WebSockets, does it, does it cause more problems than it solves, right? Uh, no, because it's going to be another thing that Alex can wiggle through. So uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's better than, you know, things that we've got now. It's going to be something new that people can use. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be the silver bullet or anything like that. But I think it's going to give, you know, rise to good use cases. I think it's okay to, you know, add these things. And if it doesn't work in, you know, certain browsers and they don't get those features, uh, I'm so frustrated with those browsers that I'm kind of okay with that. And it's yeah, like, yeah. those guys don't get the features, so like Facebook, you go to Facebook with uh, IEX and you don't get Facebook chat. And I think that's okay. Upgrade guys, come on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm okay with it. I think it gives us... Uh, so the 
Yeah. Also, uh, you know, a perfect spec doesn't uh, necessarily give us the opportunity to make a lot of money, right? So, so I know us, uh, the Comet and WebSocket experts, we're hoping for a lot of things that we're going to have to weed through, right, Alex? No, no, we're no. not. <laughs> no. well, was being There's a better years, way right? to make a living. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> Let me know when you find it. So. Well, one thing I, that I want to point out is uh, even if, if everything about WebSocket is a failure except we get it in one browser, there's one important feature that it has that we have absolutely no way of emulating or doing it with any other methods, and that is we can push, like we, we can have a stream from the browser to the server. Normally, if you have a set of data you want to send from the browser to the server, it's a series of AJAX requests. Here's some data. Oh, here's some more data. Here's some more data. So you have all these round trips going through. You can't just uh, sort of pipeline a stream of information up. But with WebSocket, you can do this. And um, even if we don't get the access control or the APIs or things like that correct, we can wrap those up. But having that ability native to JavaScript is very, very important. So I guess that's reverse, reverse AJAX or something, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> reverse, reverse AJAX. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of future-proofing your applications. So, so for you, John, one of the things that, that Kazing is really pushing is, is basically coding to standards, yeah. uh, things like that. Can you, can you mention a little bit about kind of what you guys are doing? Okay, yeah, sure. So the vision is that um, we, we sell our product into the enterprise. And uh, coming from enterprise software background, actually, uh, years ago, we were very heavily involved in uh, Java server faces, uh, what Ted is, technology Ted is using, and uh, book, also, right? also wrote a book about that's available here tonight. Um, but uh, so we have plenty of experience in the, in the enterprise industry, and it, it seems to be pretty important to those guys to, because, because the, the cycle of the development and everything is actually quite long, that um, when they invest in something, they want to make sure it's still going to be around when they're finished. So uh, the standards-based approach to their development is actually quite important to them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have this chicken and egg problem with HTML5 itself, which is that we want to, we would like to see HTML5 here sooner rather than later. And talk about the release date. Yeah, so the, what is it, 2022 is the official release date for HTML5? No, 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 which, no, which, no. Which, which, I, which I think... Which no, I think no, 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 going to no, be no, alive no, then. No, no. <laughs> Browsers, exactly. HTML. No. I don't know. We're so not going to see the release of HTML5. There yeah. will be no release of HTML5. So, so actually, so I'm, very oh, so <laughs> I'm very is supportive of this idea. I'm very. Is that why the date was so far out? Right. Yeah. yeah they exactly. Said, right? Exactly. If exactly. They would have said it's 2010. Everybody everybody's waits. Gonna wait. yep. Everybody's going to wait. Everybody's going to wait. So right. You know. So by putting it so far out at 2022 or something, then everybody says, okay, it's not realistic to wait. Yeah, I so hope let's I'm not doing form-based study. Uh, yeah, really. HTML. Until <laughs> Link supports it. <laughs> Until Link supports it. Right. So, so for example, uh, if if you if you put a date that's a little bit uh, too far out, then everybody starts looking at the actual content of the specification and starts to lock down sections of it. And we already seen uh, implementations of various parts of HTML5 in many of the browsers now, like Post Message and so on, Canvas. Uh, I'd love to see that in IE someday, by the way. Um, never happened. I, I would like to note that the parts of the spec that I'm most sanguine about for HTML5 are the parts that are already shipping in a browser. So as a, as a JavaScript library author, I am downstream not of any specification, but what the deployed browser population actually looks like. And anything else is pipe, a pipe dream as far as I'm concerned. Um, you believe it when you say it, basically. Uh, I'll believe it when I see 20% of the browsers using it. Um, so that's more than that's more than a, uh, a particular vendor saying that they will have it. It's more than two vendors saying they will have it. It's them shipping it for at least one rev and then shipping it in the, in the next rev, right? So we've seen solutions for the Comet problem shipped before by some individual vendors and then had them taken away. Um, I mean, it sh so it, you'll forgive me if I'm, I'm a little bit less... Um, uh, boosterism, I have a little bit less boosterism for um, WebSockets. I think they're a good API and a good idea, and we need them badly. Mm -hmm. um, but until we get browser implementations, I am going to hold my fire and, and, yeah. and before I bless it as a okay. one so, so Just to finish the point then. So, oh, so what I was going to say is that in order to solve that chicken and egg problem, you want to get people developing against the standard today if you can. And sure, they can prototype against trunk builds of browsers and stuff like Alex says, you know, maybe, maybe it's only in one of the browsers or something like that. But if you're actually going to deploy it, an actual application and you would like to fall forward onto whatever standards come down the pipe, you would like to be able to invest in something that has a reasonable expectation of being able to be a close approximation of what the standard will become when mm -hmm. it's finally so rubber stamped. I want, to, I want to pull Michael into this because he's also you know, working on the spec. Uh, he might have kind of an interesting, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to you, Alex. But what I want to kind of pose is, is where do you think the spec is? I mean, should, we all, should, should Alex be wrapping uh, WebSockets today? 
I mean, is the spec to that point? And well, I mean, it's not even a matter of the spec to being to any particular point. Like, there is no WebSocket to wrap, right? Like, it doesn't exist. You can't wrap it. Okay. So, um, what what we've been doing uh, with Orbited and JS.io um, is we, we now have a TCP socket emulation over Common and AJAX. And WebSocket is just another protocol and an API. So let's put the WebSocket API on the browser and then tunnel the WebSocket protocol over our TCP socket, which is just tunneled over HTTP via AJAX and Comet. And then you can write your backend server against WebSocket. Now, the, the state of the spec is such that I would not recommend going out and writing a WebSocket server and a WebSocket client like today. I mean, it's I, I just don't think we're at that point. Um, and I don't think we're going to be there for, you know, for a while. Um, but the most important part about writing future-proof applications is to realize that WebSocket is not just an API. WebSocket is an API and a protocol. So let's say you want to write something against the WebSocket API, and you don't want to tie yourself down to any one vendor's like emulation or something. Then what you have to do is make sure that you write a WebSocket server that speaks the WebSocket protocol, and then also use the WebSocket API in the browser. And so that way, once we have native WebSocket, you can just pull out the emulation layer, all the intermediary, cr in intermediary crap that you know, is taking care of, of, of all this proxying, and then you still have direct browser to server communication. Um, yeah. yeah the, so sorry, the reality of the situation is I want to is jump that over to John. And you're never going to get say, there. You know, you're proposing, let's jump on WebSocket. It's ready today. And, and Michael's kind of proposing a different uh, you know, view. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what's, uh, so one, one question that folks always ask is like, you know, if if you're emulating a standard today, mm -hmm. even you got the standard 100% right, and I doubt that it's 100% right, but I get it's I guess it's probably fairly right, close. right, you mean complete? No, I mean like the APIs as they are defined today are the same APIs that will be locked down in the standard. Yeah, that's right? what I kind of meant. By yeah, yeah, just do so, different English. Perfect. Right, sure. So, so the question is, assuming that so even assuming that that's true, that it's exactly equivalent, when the browsers all have WebSocket. Do you still need any kind of emulation layer? Isn't it completely redundant? Well, when all the browsers and pick it up. Let's just let Alex. He's been yeah, dying to, yeah, so to jump on the, board the, here. The, but like I, Alex I said, back up a little bit here and say that um, we can do Comet today, right? So the population of things that are allowing us to do Comet today, the hacks that work today are not going away, right? They've been around for a decade and therefore are not going away. And if I look at new things, I go, aha. There's going to be some magical shiny future in which I have this new, sp I, I, I have completely compatible implementations of this new specification. Um, at which point I say, I found the flaw in your plan, which is to get everyone to implement everything the exact same way, because nobody ever does. The history of JavaScript development is to know that everybody screws something up, right? Um, every browser vendor uh, either implements early, or they implement late, or they implement inconsistently, um, and we find some. Because people, humans are involved in this process on every end. Um, that, yeah. <laughs> I, I have one welcome welcome our robot overlords. I would, I, would, um, I would like to give credit to the guys running, especially Hixie, Ain Hixon running the, the specification for HTML5. Because he's doing a tremendous job of not only specifying the syntax of stuff, but like really getting down into the, the depths of what the semantics are of how it actually behaves. Mm -hmm. And the attempt is to try and address a lot of these issues we've seen um, due to maybe under-specification in older versions of the spec. So I don't want to be a downer about this, but what I'm saying is that the old stuff, like, I don't, I'm not hopeful that there will ever be a day where we can say, we're just going to rip the old stuff out. What's going to happen is that you're going to build another system. And in that next system, you're going to be able to use WebSocket natively. Maybe not in the old one, mm -hmm. but some years hence, you'll be able to say, aha, yeah, I'll just do this with a WebSocket. As mm -hmm. opposed to saying, I'm going to use some library that might do WebSocket, or might do Bayou, or might do... Uh, you know, DWR style polling or, 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 or. Um, yeah. I think you're going to have your library of options today, which are going to guarantee some amount of forward compatibility at the detriment of things like latency and scalability. Mm -hmm. And that at some point in the future, you'll be able to make a cut. You'll be able to say, wow, how did we ever use this piece of gigantic <coughs> crud, which does all this stuff that we don't need to do anymore? And you'll, you'll think of it as arcane and backward, and that'll be great. Yeah, so I want to kind of continue well, on. Like with we do about the old app servers with their thread per connection sure, strategy, right? Sure, thread per connection, yeah, request. Uh, so I want to get a little bit deeper into what you're saying, Alex. Uh, may put you on the spot, uh, pull out your crystal ball. When are we going to see... Don't do that. When are we going to see WebSocket and Dojo? Is it going to be 2008, 2009, 2010? And the same question with Bayou, are you going to bring WebSocket support? Like one of the things it says is it supports multiple forms of transport is one of the number one goals. Oh, sure. So I, I, wish, I should say that, that there's the spec that I helped work on and, and Greg mm -hmm. Wilkins of Jetty helped work on. Um, and it, it is absolutely a stopgap, right? It, we, 
it deals with transports as an implementation detail, and so you'll be able to plug in WebSocket and it'll get better. Um, but that doesn't make it a good, necessarily, a good hedge, because at some point you're just going to want to use a regular WebSocket, right? Mm -hmm. That will be the right answer. So um, it's, it's been designed as a okay for now, terrible for later, <laughs> intentionally designed that way so that we're not saying this is the right answer, this is the, this is the protocol that you should use in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but if I had a crystal ball, I'd say that we'll wind up with an emulation you know, that will talk to something like the TCP socket or a, Kaza a Kazang server um, that will talk to whatever people call a web socket sooner rather than later. You know, we'll probably have something like it in you know, less than a year. But yeah. at the same time, I expect that that'll change and that we'll have a versioning problem and that it'll be, it'll fall onto the shoulders of both the server vendors and the JavaScript vendors to figure yeah. out what it means. Let's let Michael here. He, he kinda yeah. um, so the, the JS.O project, uh, we've very recently, um, in the past week, uh, just committed uh, support for Dojo's uh, build system. Um, so Dojo has a package manager. And so because we're using, in JS.O, we're, we're, we're allowing you to use the Dojo package manager, uh, it should be very straightforward and trivial to use our WebSock implementation with Dojo. Um, now, the, the, the one caveat to this is you have to understand that um, this protocol, you'll be developing a server against the protocol and a client against the API, um, and you just have to remember that if these things do change, um, you're going to have to, you know, alter your application. Um, we're going to have to work out some way to do versioning, and we might just shoehorn something in, just, you know, check the version number and we'll have our own versioning, but um, as long as you have that in mind that things might al alter subtly, um, then, you know, basically today you can use Dojo and WebSocket. Uh, yeah. Is that the ahead, public WebSocket API, or is that inside some other API? Uh, it's the HTML5 WebSocket it's, it's, API. Okay, great. Cool. I think that's awesome for pushing forward the usage of the standard. Yeah. So that that you know, talking about pushing forward the usage of the standard, we're going to get back to Dion. Haven't uh, kind of jumped around you a little bit, not by purpose. But uh, I want to talk about uh, adoption, right, of uh, WebSockets versus adoption of Comet. You know, what have you seen as, uh, you know, my personal opinion, right, as, as doing research for this uh, panel, I, I seem to run into a lot of Kazing articles, right? <laughs> so who else out there is, is pushing WebSockets, and is it going to be as slow to kind of adoption uh, as, as Comet has been? Uh, I think so, because um, right now it's thought of as a niche. Right, so it's going to take time for that to happen. When Ajax came around, it was kind of like the beauty of it was people could just drop in a little thing, have a little effect, and they say they've got Ajax, mm -hmm. even though it was a pretty normal site with one little addition. This is a re-architecture of your system. It's a much bigger deal. So because of that, it's going to take longer, and uh, adoption is going to take longer. But I do think, like I said earlier, that, um, again, most people are going to start seeing these systems, and the ones that have this event-based systems are going to win. And so you're going to say, yeah, I prefer friend feed to Twitter for this reason. I prefer this side to this side for this reason. And then the market is going to push things in that direction and we'll be used to this real-time web and then that will be the normal way that things are done. But it's going to take time and that's okay. Okay. So, so our next JavaScript frameworks, uh, are, are they going to have to be layered WebSocket, then check if we have Flash, then check if we have streaming, then check if we have long polling, and then check if we have polling? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's what Kazang is delivering right now. Or we just use Flash or Silverlight and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the less of a major re-architecture we have to do here, the, the better. Because we're just a few small steps away by, by taking HTTP and making it way more suitable for doing push type applications. The, f yeah. the first thing is to take a policy like Safari does where we have the connection separated per window. And, and that, that makes things just tremendously easier. And it, in fact, the, the guy just sitting down, I'm going to write my own comment implementation, you can just about get it to work if you do it in Safari because of this, this connection policy that's two per window rather than two per browser. And but everything now, else is different, Ted, right? Well, well <laughs> perhaps, but I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on, on what makes it diffi difficult for somebody to write a, a push-style application in, in a browser. And th this this is... This doesn't require a new protocol or a new API. This is simply the realization of the browser vendors that the, the things that can't communicate with each other through JavaScript should have separate connections. So if you have a separate window object, you should have a, a, a separate TCP 
connection. And then there are a bunch of simple things that we could do with HTTP itself that would make it way better for doing push applications as well. Once again, we don't need new protocols or even new APIs perhaps, but uh, we can go a lot further. Okay. All right, well, so uh, what I want to suggest is a, a quick thought experiment, and that is we want to write Gmail. Um, we want to just build our own version of Gmail from the ground up. Uh, so if you want to do this, uh, probably you would just the, the, the common idea on how this would be done is you make some sort of web server, like maybe something in Java, and you, you have to connect it up to some kind of mail server and some database for authentication. So you write a bunch of code that allows people to make requests. You know, they, they put in their authentication information, makes a request, comes back, then you say, I want to get mail now. When you ask the web server to get mail, the web server actually goes and gets the mail on your behalf. Um, and it has some way of processing it. But then let's say we want to add XMPP. Now we need to shoehorn some kind of common implementation either into the web server or put it beside the server and then have it set up where when you want to send a chat message, you tell the web server, send a chat message for me. And the web server actually sends it on your behalf, but when it gets one back, it needs to push it back to you via Comet. Um, well, so the problem I have with this kind of architecture is that if we just had direct access to the mail server and the XMPP server, then we actually wouldn't need the web server whatsoever. Just throw it out take your out-of-the-box web server, your out-of-the-box chat server, and just connect to them and do what we've done on the desktop for 20 years. And so this idea of new protocols and not needing them is actually completely backwards. We already have all these protocols, and we already use them somewhere in our stack, and it's just a matter of let's take those protocols and extend them to the browser and stop trying to put something so right I, in the I'd middle. I'd like to ask the audience, how many web developers would like to learn the IMAP protocol in detail? <coughs> <laughs> Whose IMAP protocol and which oh. version? <laughs> Well, it, it's a the API is actually simple. We have a very simple API. It's called get mail. So you say imap.getmail. Yeah. And, and you get mail back. That's it. Wow, you can put it into a div and you're, you're good to go. You don't have to know the protocol. Let's That's why we're doing it for you. Let's extend that thought experiment, right? And let's, let's take the thought experiment to examine how you would build it if you couldn't do what you're proposing, right? So today you would build your integration with your web tier. You'd have some sort of client API for IMAP that's probably in Java or Python or something like that that you already have to understand in order to be able to interact with the back-end IMAP system. Only now you don't just have to understand that, you also have to understand how to invent your own application-specific version of that to relay the information back and forth between the browser and the web tier. So we haven't swapped one problem for another. We've just eliminated a whole bunch of extra work by saying don't do it on the server, do it on the client. Anyone uh, comments? I want to kind of wrap things up here. Final comment? Anyone? I, I, I think that the, the real battle here is that JavaScript have, has always been viewed as a fringe language. And uh, not really a fringe language, but just one you, you only muck around with when you really have to, when you really have to deploy an application on the web. But we're really getting to the point where it's a first-class language. I mean, it does everything you need to do, and it's just a matter of people believing that you can actually have first-class support of a protocol in the browser and write applications just like you'd write desktop applications but in a browser, and I say we're there, we can do it. We now have network protocols in the browser. We, we have wonderful uh, GUI toolkits like Dojo. Just build out your GUI, build out your network stack, and you're done. Yeah, that's right. You're here. Yeah. So, so what I want to do now is uh, shift gears a little bit and uh, kind of push out to uh, questions in the audience. But before I do that, I want to take a moment, especially again, to thank Stephanie and also thank Chris and to thank Google for having yeah. us here today. So thank the web builder and uh, the many panelists for coming. And uh, I think, you know, this is an exciting event. We're all very, uh, you know, I think we all have a lot more we'd love to say and love to talk about. So, so I think definitely we should look at uh, setting up another event maybe a year out, something like this, as things have changed. And uh, so if, uh, if Vest won't have us, the web builder, we'll, we'll have you at the Java user group for sure. So, you know, if you guys are, uh, we'll definitely talk about that. So you'll have another opportunity if you don't, uh, you haven't heard what you want to hear today. So I want to go ahead and start with questions. Anyone? I have a comment. How about getting the uh, vendors uh, panel next year to talk about this? Oh, issues. I'd love to. The browser yeah. vendors. Yeah. We're going to have sure. another browser one. It's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, a lot of this. We didn't talk about browsers yeah. and such. We'll, we'll let yeah, Van. Uh, go ahead. Good luck getting Apple. Well, uh, this really isn't a question. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a, I just, this is such a perfect segue to make a quick plug. Um, we have a Google Technology user group that is meeting here November 12th, and Charles Jolly of the Sprout Core project is going to be presenting. So if you believe in what Michael was just talking about of rich clients, uh, you would be very interested in that talk. Uh, the Sprout Core library is what's used for MobileMe and a lot of other rich client applications. <laughs> Great. 
Great. Anyone? Questions? Somebody mentioned there was a uh, problem with having to encrypt everything, and I don't see why that is any sort of performance uh, issue because you can always take Hello World, tell everybody you've encrypted. It still reads Hello World. They don't know it. Uh, it's, you're just using identity instead of some hashing algorithm. That's right. So, so the, foundation, the, the fundamental issue there is, though, that the way that you tell the browser that you want to um, use this secure kind of communication that's going to navigate through those web proxies successfully um, doesn't give you the ability to specify that you don't want to have any encryption algorithm. It doesn't give you the ability to specify the null encryption. Although, funnily enough, um, just today or yesterday, uh, I sent an email to the uh, feedback for the HTML5 working group um, suggesting that as a way to navigate proxies successfully without paying the overhead, to actually use that as a, a strategy for, for, for navigating SSL without, a, without the CPU overhead and memory overhead of copying. Sure. So before we jump on to the next question, uh, one of the things I want to remind you guys is that I will be doing a, uh, a brief kind of workshop on introduction to Common, show, Comet, showing you how to, how to work with uh, kind of the, the Bayou implementation on, on Jetty, the Comet D stuff. Uh, that, that Alex is, has done a lot of great work on. So, you know, after the questions, we'll jump on into that. Thanks. Uh, there was a lot of talk about comment. Um, what do you guys think about pushlet technology? Uh, from my understanding, it's a lot uh, simpler and easier framework to work with. Thanks. It's, it's just the same thing with a different name and a slightly different API. I mean, everyone has been making up things and calling it names. And, I mean, I don't particularly see pushlet as being any better or worse than anything else. It's just, like, older. And threaded, so <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, it's a, I've, seen, I've seen some failed attempts. So, yes, uh, this is a question for Alex and Mike, well, uh, the other panelists. Um, Alex, you mentioned that we have to work with the worst of tools. And Mike, you say JavaScript is a great language, and I agree. Uh, what can you foresee in the future uh, when other vendors, and specifically Microsoft, is toying with the idea of bringing other languages like Ruby? It's, it has ARACs. So it, it, it will be perhaps a third language, or what are your thoughts about opening up the browsers for having different languages in order to create these amazing applications? We actually started with that, with Internet Explorer. I mean, they, they designed their whole engine around the idea of multiple languages, and that's why you've got... You know, JavaScript is a language in Internet Explorer. Um, it's, the, it's the IE part of JS and IE. And the, the issue there is that they're not revving the language. So JavaScript, as, as exposed to you in uh, WebKit Nightly or in a Mozilla Nightly or even in Mozilla Firefox 3, is a beautiful, wonderful functional language. JavaScript, as exposed to you in IE 7, is a terrible, terrible, terrible nightmare. Plus, they're DOM, uh, which is worse. So. Um, Browser being used by uh, Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it won, yeah. but not, the, but not by the virtue of its technical elegance. Um, <laughs> so, well, that's true, right? It's the worst solution for any language, for any problem, but it's the most pervasive solution to every problem, and therefore it gets used for every problem. So, um, I, I, I have hope for that, insofar as they can solve the revving problem for any language, right? So, if they can rev any language, like if you got Ruby as as MRI, if you got Matt's as Ruby implementation today in IE, and they didn't rev Ruby or the standard library for Ruby for five years, would you still want Ruby as versus JavaScript? I argue no, right? I argue you don't want that language any more than you want the, IE, the JavaScript that you've got in IE now. So um, let's focus on the real problem, which is getting browser vendors to go and implement things in a timely fashion and force updates um, out to clients. And then we can have a, a, a lively discussion about the merits of languages um, and how JavaScript or Ruby or any other language that's hosted in those environments should and, and will evolve. Yeah, and I, I think there was also some discussion within Mozilla Foundation about what they should use as a foundation of their um, new and uh, evolved JavaScript VM. And they even took a look at Action Java. Or, yeah, Action Street, the Tamarind stuff. And uh, they took a look at Java at one point and threw it out. And I think, I think uh, that the justification was that there's really only room for one VM in the browser with regards to mobile devices and things like that. And so as a developer community, you want to be able to have maximal reach. Oh, and 
It's a perfect segue because the thing that drives browser adoption is value. And I'm hearing from the clients we're dealing with, and some of them are competitors or HP, and also others at this level, three things they want. Less server cost, the ability to distribute the workload across their users. Because you got broadband devices, you got phones with JVMs, and that's why the Opera guys can get a browser along with their server architecture. That's 100K in a JVM on phones that aren't broadband connected. They want, and I think it's a great approach you're using with securing and encrypting, because then you can have, if you've got data storage in the browser and data processing in the browser, you've got the ability to have client side data stores, which actually enables a thing called data portability. Because if you've got an actual data store to put your data in, you can right. actually take it. Right. So these are the things that will drive. So and like the security model you're talking about, where you can even process new keys minute to minute, that's a real world security model that people can trust and, and individuals can control. So these are the things that will drive browser adoption. And back to the languages for a second, like the thing that I like about, say, Ruby, I really like Ruby, is the standard library. Do you get that standard library, or do you just get the Ruby language? And that's the issue with JavaScript is that Alex has built, you know, the JavaScript standard <laughs> library, so to speak, from scratch by himself, but you don't get it. Not by myself. There's lots of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry. The browser has to be lean and mean. And, you know, yeah. Well, so your argument that the browser has to be lean and mean, um, and I, I argue that you're completely wrong. Yeah, we got more as well. <laughs> the browser Moore's isn't lean or mean now. I mean, it's, it's handling completely unwell-formed markup in order to describe a layout, which is plain text on the wire, right? If you're actually going to go build the layout of any web page, you wouldn't do it with these technologies if you were mocking it up in a binary format. Yeah. And it would be significantly more efficient, and you just render it out that way. To your point about Opera being able to put things out to a screen over uh, wireless broadband, right? You wouldn't do it this way. But we do it this way because it, it enables clients to be sovereign and enables them to rev independently of the servers. And so those advantages um, put Moore's Law in the front line of the, of how we solve these problems and not technical elegance. So we've got a terrible solution for a broad set of problems, and because it's broadly applicable, it is the best solution. So the, the question is so the multiple support of languages. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a question, right? The multiple support of languages. Yeah, let's so why don't we stick on <coughs> just one basic language, like J, uh, JavaScript? Because it's not a great language. Yeah. yeah. So let's uh, let's switch gears here. Let's keep to the panelists. Uh, so what I want to do now is to jump back over to the Google moderator, right? Because we, we promised that if you voted questions up there, so this is an anonymously posted question, but I'll let you in on a clue that I posted it, and I posted it for someone because I didn't have his permission to post it here, but it's from Greg Wilkins on Jetty. Uh, so I let the cat out of the bag. Maybe I should have done that earlier. But anyway, it says, uh, and, and I'll ask this to Michael Carter because he's actually mentioned some of this to me uh, in the past. It says, WebSockets protocol is an upgrade of the HTTP connection to a full bidirectional socket. Will the current web infrastructure, proxies, firewalls, web ca caches, NSA snooping, load balancers, Apache front-end servers, et cetera, be able to cope with WebSockets? And, uh, well, so... Maybe. And uh, let me throw in there one more thing that he left out, and that is uh, antivirus programs. Uh, End-user antivirus programs also will hijack your connection without the browser anyone knowing and buffer the whole thing so that they can check it and make sure that, you know, in your streaming application, like somehow you didn't send a virus down the wire to JavaScript. But um, so my answer is that um, right now we can definitely do that with encryption. It's done. It works. And so now the battle is just... You know, can we change our handshake such that it looks like it's SSL to proxies? Even if it's not, I mean, can we just make it look like it's encryption and, and get it through? And that's really our only strategy here. And, and once we can, uh, you know, either we can or we can't, we'll find out. But at the very least, we have encrypted bidirectional communication. We have a secondary problem, though, when we bite that off, which is that um, SSL is based on IP match for uh, uh, certificates. Uh, so advertised certificates have to match not the host name, but the IP, which the certificate was assigned to. So if you think we have a deployment problem with Comet today based on multiple subdomains and hosts, um, try scaling this bad boy over a single IP and then making sure that it's fast and geolocatable. All right, good well, luck. Well, no, but the, the suggestion isn't necessarily to use SSL. It's to use something that looks like SSL to the proxies. Oh, I understand. I, I do understand that. Um, but, but again, this is going to require equivalent re-architecture and engineering to kind of like upgrade all the browsers and make it look like it's doing that. So I'm thinking about the short term, how do we, how do we make this kind of work? And, and you're going to have to, in the medium term, put together uh, 
Oh, it's a windfall to VeriSign, let's put it that way. Right, right. And systems administrators everywhere. Yeah. So. so I want to want to go ahead and end the panel with uh, Alex's final word there. Um, anyway, I want to thank everyone, and uh, basically we'll take a 10-minute break. Come back at 9 o'clock uh, for the workshop. Hope you all stick around. And Bess wants to say something real quickly. Uh, so uh, you can take this opportunity, you know, uh, to take a break, uh, but we do want to actually give out uh, close to like $2,000 worth of uh, prizes, including books you know, from all these, you know, wonderful publishers. Uh, so uh, can you raise your hand if you don't have a raffle tickets? Um, how, uh, okay, so uh, we might, you know, give out some uh, um, prizes out during break. Uh, stay around and with your tickets.